here we are again uh, for another Sunday morning download. But the question is why? Why a download? Why? What part does this play in your life? Just, just think about that. What part does this Sunday morning play in your life? Do you, and, and do you really need this teaching? I mean, really? Do you, do you need it? See, the part that this plays in your life is most likely what someone else told you of what this is to play, or this, uh, this here is something that you determined what this was going to be long before today. Now, <clears throat> here's what I want to say. What if both of those reasons, and I don't even know your reason, but what if both of those reasons are really not what this is about? What if you really do need this? What if the reason for this in your mind, what if it's way off? Is that possible? I mean, what if it's not even close? Now, why do I say way off? Because my concept of church was way off. And that includes most of my years as a pastor. And I've been full-time ministry for over 30 years. So with the wrong mindset, you might take what this has to offer and put it in a place where it was never meant to be. And so for reasons of teaching, I want to challenge you this morning in the way you have thought about church to begin. You think you can handle that? All right. Let's pray. Father, we ask you to make clear what your thoughts are to us individually. Amen. Uh, I want to thank you for your support um, as Paul, the Apostle Paul, thanked his supporters. He said this in Philippians. He said, my heart overflows with joy when I think of you, of how you showed your love to me by your financial support of my ministry. For even though you have so little, you still continue to help me and every, uh, at every opportunity. And this is how Nicole and I feel, um, and all of Powerhouse feel as well. We thank you um, online here, everybody that are supporting, are planting seeds in this ministry. Uh, without people like you, this ministry wouldn't be here. So I thank you again. Did you know that back in the Victorian era in England, the lowest form of accommodation was a tightly stretched rope it, uh, that people could actually bend over and sleep. And it was only a penny. It only cost a penny. The ones who usually used this accommodation were drunken sailors who spent all their money on drinking. And this is said to be how the term hangover originated. Okay, so here we are being discipled, trained, equipped, empowered for what purpose? Is it to know a little more? Some people look at this like a student would look at elective classes. Remember elective classes? It's those classes that are not essential, but are nice to have. I remember an elective class I had in high school. It was Piano 101. No one in the class really took it seriously because it wasn't an essential class. People just were there because they had to pick an elective. And it was an easy A. All you had to do is just try a little bit and you can get a good grade. Now, in that class, one of my friends was in that class and he was actually a really good piano player. He played for his church. And so this class for him was kind of a kickback class. And since he was my friend, and I didn't want him to be alone, I kicked back with him. And we pretty much did nothing the whole class. I did, though, ask him to teach me something. I said, I, I said would you teach me something on the piano since we're just kind of hanging around doing little scale assignments or something. I, I asked him if he would teach me something. Not, 
not so that I can learn how to play the piano, but so that people could think that I knew how to play the piano. So I said, just teach me, teach me. I, I, I want to learn something um, that's not a whole song, but something that I could just walk up to a piano and just, just play enough that people can think that, oh, you play the piano? And then I'll stop. You know, so teach me an intro to something. I mean, and so he did. And so today, I can play the beginning of two songs only. <laughs> One is Moonlight, Son Moonlight Sonata, and the other is Charlie Brown. <laughs> In other words, knowing a little bit was good enough for me. If you look to being discipled a little bit as good enough, you're missing a lot. This is not just about gaining more. It's not about gaining more information, but rather it's about gaining understanding for something you already have. Discipleship is not an elective class. It's an essential component that is intended to help you understand so that you'll get it. Do you get it? Get what? Let me explain. Here's how it works. When you be begin a relationship with God, God gives you everything up front and then teaches you how to walk in it. That's how it works. You get everything from the get-go. You have complete fullness right at the beginning. And then he teaches you how to stay full. You are complete in him. And then he teaches you what that looks like. This is all about learning how to walk in the fullness of God that you already have if you're following him. It's not just about getting more information about God. You're learning how to stay full. You're learning how to walk through this life in that fullness. Sadly, many Christians don't know how to do that. And so more and more Christians strive and strive and strive to get more of God in their life as their goal. What's, what's wrong with that? I mean, come on, is, it, is there something wrong with getting more of God? I mean, what's wrong with getting cl a closer relationship? What's wrong with acquiring more anointing? What's wrong with taking on more gifts? Discipleship is not about getting more. Discipleship is about understanding how to use more of what you already have. All this is about understanding how to use what you've been given already. See, I don't have more, anything more than you have in God. I don't. And you don't have anything more than you have in God. But you might have more understanding in how to access and use what you have. Does that make sense? Discipleship is about understanding how to walk in the fullness you already have. The minute you started following God, you received a full inheritance, a complete fullness, everything. This isn't all about acquiring more and more of God. This is not about accumulating more weapons and more tools throughout time. You already have all the weapons and tools you will ever need. This is all about learning how to use them. Because you possess everything. So what are you going to do with what you already have? This is all about learning what you have in Christ, in him. It's not about pleasing God enough to receive more. Jesus came to earth to show us what fullness of life looks like. And this is why shame has no hold on the followers of Christ. Because we have all of him in us. We have the fullness of Christ. Shame is all about not having enough. 
not being enough, not knowing enough. It's ironic that one of the most powerful chains that the devil uses to tie us up with is to get us to believe that we don't have enough, that we are not enough. When the truth is revealed, we become more aware of who he is and who you are and what we have. We've had the fullness of Christ in us from the first moment we decided to follow him. We just have to learn how to use that. So discipleship is all about learning what we have, who we are, what we can do. This not enough thing doesn't fit the children of God. It really doesn't. When we hear verses that speak of getting anything you ask, you know those kind of verses that say, if you just ask in my name, I'll give you whatever you ask, right? What, what kind of thoughts go through your mind? Here's one. John 14, 13 says, for I will do whatever you ask me to do when you ask me in my name. And that is how the son will show what the father is really like and bring glory to him. Ask me anything in my name and I will do it for you. And then it goes on to say things like, in the scripture, it says like, everything in Jesus is yes and amen. 2 Corinthians 1.19 says, Jesus Christ is the son of God, and he is the one whom Timothy, Silas, and I have preached to you. And he has never been, he has never been both a yes and no. He has always been and always will be for us a resounding yes, for all of God's promises find their yes of fulfillment in him. And as his yes and our amen ascend to God, we bring him glory. So everything in Christ is yes and amen. His pro- it's just yes and amen. His yes, your amen. amen. <laughs> and whatever you ask will be done. Amen. <laughs> whatever? Hmm. See, to me that... Kind of sounds, that could be a little dangerous, can it be? Right? I mean, if you say this and somebody like, you know, whatever. I mean, some people might take advantage of this, right? Well, you know what God says to that? He says, I hope they do. I hope they do take advantage. Someone needs to take advantage of me. When God grants you something... He expects you to take him for granted. Problem is, is we don't. We look at verses like that and we say, yeah, that's nice, but. And so what happens? No one takes advantage of it. No, not actually no one, but you know what I mean. we become on the side of backing off of it. That's why when we think of this could be taken advantage of, and it can't just mean that, God says, take advantage of it. Go ahead. But, but what if when God grants you something, he expects you to take him for granted? You were designed to have a life that carries more than you can hold. so that you can give it away constantly. That's what this is about. You're learning how to access, activate, and use the fullness you have in him so that you can give it away constantly. This is not just about filling ourselves up, getting full. Well, I had a great day. I'm just on. This is not about just filling you because you are already full. This is about understanding what you have, why? So that you can give it away. Still with me? We previously assessed the effect that the world is having on us. If you remember, we looked at what directs our responses. Are our responses directed by faith or by fear? We know that our faith directs heaven. We saw that with Jesus. 
faith directed his an- his actions. When the woman with the issue of bleed of bleeding touched his garment, he turned in the pressing. When they were pressing on him, he turned. He changed direction. We've also previously learned that fear and doubt can direct us away from God. When someone from the household of Jairus came and said to Jairus, stop bothering the master. Jairus had just walked up to Jesus and said, my daughter is dying, and if you come and lay hands on her, she will live. And Jesus immediately started to follow Jairus. In the pressing, immediately started to follow to his house. And then when someone from the household of Jairus came and said to Jairus, stop bothering the master because she's already dead. You see, what was it that changed the direction of Jesus' plans that day? He came in and they're, they're going. He's obviously in a direction, but he instantly stopped and he began to follow Jairus. What was it that changed his direction? Faith. Jairus said, if you place your hands on my daughter, she will live. She will be better. It was that faith that changed the direction. And then when someone from the household of Jairus came and and said, stop, Jesus immediately turned to Jairus and said, stop, stop it. He's like, whoa, stop the fear and only believe. Believe what? Believe what you just said to me a few minutes ago. If you lay your hands on her, she will be well. The servant said, she's dead. Don't trouble. Jesus was telling Jairus, that's fear talking. Stop that. Fear has the ability to rob you of your faith. We have the ability to stop fear. We know that because Jesus told Jairus to stop fear. He knew that Jairus had the ability to stop fear. We also looked at some of the fears and the negative components that direct us away from, uh, away from God. Uh, um, these negative things that we deal with today, like worry, stress, guilt, regret, shame, hopelessness, discouragement. When we looked at these things the other week, the first thing that we did is we identified that those components, though that list that I just said, are not from God. They're from the devil. It's important to know that. Sometimes people think, but if a negative, something like that, shame or guilt, if it causes me to do good, then it must be from God. No, it isn't. It never is. And it never will be. But, but if good comes from it, it must be God. No. No, that's, that's, the, that's the counterfeit of the enemy. Because if, if the enemy can get you to believe that something negative can bring good, guess what? You're going to look to the negative as something that has place now in your life. The devil's purpose is to move us away from God. Last week we saw the need to shut the door to those things that have been in our lives and have overwhelmed and overpowered us. That's where we ended last week. That brings us to a question. How do we shut the door? I mean, it's, it's, it's good that we need to know that we need to shut the door. And many of you probably left last week or listened to this message and said, yeah, I'm going to shut some doors, but how do you do that? I couldn't give all the information at one thing, so I'll just spread it out. Are you interested in knowing? Yes. All right. So the way we shut the door, let me say it this way. Remember how we determined that our interaction with God is supernatural? You know, where we do the natural and God does the super part? So let's look at what's involved in the natural part. The natural part involves an action. James 4, 7 says, Submit therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. So when we 
move away from the devil, we we go the other direction. It's one movement. When we resist the devil, we go towards. Resist the devil, we go towards. We don't just resist the devil. But we resist him and move the other direction. Resist the devil, draw near to God. So the answer to the question of how we shut the door, we shut the door with his presence. That's how we shut the door. How we always shut the door is with his presence. When we resist, we say, no, we don't want to do that. I won't do that. We, whatever. That's one thing. But we can't just, that's, it, it's, that's only half the action. It's resist the devil and draw near to God. We resist and we go the other direction, which is the presence of God. Does that make sense? So give me some descriptive words of what uh, is in God's presence. In God's presence, there's what? Liberty. Just one at a time, one at a time. Raise your hand so I can, we can hear each one. Liberty. Liberty. Yeah. Peace. Joy. joy. Lots of joy. <coughs> Worship. Love. Love. Yeah, kindness. Patience. Gentleness. <laughs> thankfulness, right? I mean, all this. So the question is now, how do we get into God's presence? Right, we know that God's presence shuts the door, so we need to keep going. How do we get into God's presence? Well, for one, God is not good at being loving. He is love. That's like saying, I am not good at being Bob Andrade. I am Bob Andrade. I'm not good at acting like Bob. I am Bob. God is not good at loving. He is love. God is not good at, at being patient. He is patience. God is not good at having joy. He is joy. And you will find his presence in joy, in peace. Be filled with joy. What is that? Smile, laughter, happiness, and you will be right in the middle of him. Are you starting to see how that works? Drawing near to God is about action. Joy is that action. Peace is that action, etc. Being joyful is that action. Being peaceful is that action. Experiencing God's presence takes place while you are experiencing things like joy and peace. Have you ever been in a place where you can feel that God's presence is absent? I mean, his felt presence is absent. Okay, describe, you describe what was in God's presence. Describe now the feelings that are in that place where God's presence is absent. R raise your hand. Yeah. Rest. Stress. Fear. Fear. Emptiness. Emptiness. Hatred. Hatred. Yeah. In those places, joy is absent. Peace is absent. Love is absent. Hope is absent. This is another reason why we are learning to shift the atmosphere around us. Amen. Where you find joy, where you find laughter, where you find happiness, where you find peace and kindness, you will find God's presence. God's presence is not just found in solitude. It's not just found in meditation. It's not just found in song. Those are great things. But somehow, if we just stay there, then we begin to think that God's presence is just something that we call upon and we just, we, we, it's only done in a solitude moment. But let me tell you, God's presence is found in everything that is of him. So if you, if, if shutting the door is, is, if we shut the door by being in his presence and being in his presence is being 
in laughter and smiles and joy, then we need it, it's we need to understand that God's presence is more than just your prayer closet. Nothing wrong with your prayer closet. But there's so many facets of his presence, right? I mean, even if you're in your prayer closet and from one day to another, I bet you it's different. And so we need to expand and understand that these things of God, that his presence are found in these things. So do you want God's presence? Seek joy. Laughter. Smiles. Like, I don't know, do I, do I summons God from heaven to this place? Start smiling. Start smiling. Start bringing joy into that place. Does that make sense? Now, with all that in mind, let's look at 10, let's look at our list of 10 keys to shifting atmospheres. The 10 keys we are learning about are, and I, I, one is believe, two, believe with expectation, and then having a victorious mindset, being filled with the Holy Spirit, allowing for the fruit of the Spirit to manifest, thankfulness, asking God for angelic help, using your words in alignment with heaven, declaring the opposite spirit that is present, and celebration. So we started to look last week at number seven, asking for angelic help. Let me approach that in this way. What is God's name? What is God's name? Well, one at a time so I can get, I can hear. Okay, Jesus, what is, I am, I am. Yahweh, Yahweh. Elohim. Elohim, Jehovah, Jehovah. Jireh, Jehovah Nisi, Jesus, Jesus. Yeshua, Yeshua. <laughs> yeah. So let's look at some of the names that are of God, just some, because there's many. El Shaddai. Right? That means all-sufficient one, Lord Almighty, Elohim. That's a plural word. That's God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Elohim, that's the Most High God, the Judge, the Creator. We see that in Genesis, where it says us. Let us make man, and then let us, Elohim. That's plural. It's a plural word, meaning the three, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Adonai. That means Lord, Master, Yahweh, means Lord, Jehovah. Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Nisi, right? Jehovah Jireh means the Lord will provide. Jehovah Nisi means the Lord, my banner, my miracle. Jehovah Raha means the Lord, my shepherd. Jehovah Rapha means the Lord that heals. Jehovah Shama means the Lord is there. Jehovah Sit. Sitkanu means the Lord, our righteousness. Jehovah Mekadishkim means the, I didn't just make that up either, okay? M-E-D-O-D-D-I-S-H-K-E-M. The Lord who sanctifies you, the Lord who makes you holy. Yeah. Mekadishkim. You may not be able to understand it with my accent, but anyway. So which one of these is God's name? All of them. Now, have you ever wondered why God has so many names? Right? I mean, why didn't he just make it simple like all the other religions, right? Zeus, Allah, Buddha, right? You know, they all have just, they all have one name. You go to God, it's I am, uh, I am Elohim, El Shaddai. Wow. Why is that? Well, look at it from this standpoint. Let me just break that down. God's name identify the roles he plays. For example, to Nicole, I am a husband. To my children, I am a father. To my mom, I am a son. To my brothers and sisters, I am a brother. To other people, I am a pastor. Not to others, but to some. <laughs> to others, I am a musician. One person, many roles. And with God, it's one God, many functions. He's so much 
that when he steps into roles, we can identify. So number seven is our, of our 10 keys to shifting the atmosphere is asking for angelic help. Let's talk about angels for a second. What are angels? Our guardians, our helpers. Okay. Keep going. What is their primary function? Messengers. They're messengers. Yeah, they're messengers. They do, but they messenger. Um, what do you know about angels? Anything? What do you What do you know? What What do you know? Just don't give me everything. Just give me one thing. They worship God. Okay. They're They're good. They They're good and evil. What else? Okay. Okay. What do you know from what you've you you've got your information from scripture, or maybe it's from other things, but what from scripture do you know that angels have done? Fight. Announcements. Fight. Fight. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Protect. Like you said, he said he's a guardian. Yeah. So think with me. Why do you think that people think that humans turn into angels when they go to heaven? Do you know that people think that, right? Why do you think they think that? They were taught that. Okay, they were taught that. What makes them believe it, though? Cartoons? <laughs> yeah. No, listen to that. That's, that's where I got it from. Say that again. What did you say? Okay, re re remember that. I'm, we're going to come back to that. Yeah, uh, okay. So let me ask you this. Do angels have greater or lesser abilities than man, than human beings? Lesser. lesser. So which beings of the two are higher or greater or more powerful? Okay, let me ask you again. So do angels have greater or lesser abilities than man or human beings? Do angels have greater or lesser abilities than man or human beings right now. Are you questioning yourself? What was your last answer? Yes. Okay. So which beings are higher, greater, or powerful? You see, we look at what is more powerful by abilities, right? That's a simple way of doing that. And we're looking at angelic beings and human beings. So there's a mix up there. Right? There's kind of a wait a second thing, right? So let me ask you this. If, you, if we had to make a chart, let's just take five. If we had to make a chart, and, and on the chart is plants, man, God, angels, and animals, what order would they go? Who's number one? God. Then what? Man. Man? Then who? Angels. Angels? Then who? Animals? And then plants. Okay, so you were really fast at getting to that. But as I began to say abilities and about more powerful and about things, it kind of was going every which way. See, there's a little mix up there. So listen to this verse. Kind of goes off of what we were talking about, what, what uh, uh, was said over there. It's Psalms 8, starting with verse 3. And this is what it says. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them, you have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands and put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea. And that swim in the paths of the sea, Lord, oh Lord, how majestic is your name. So what's that again here? So we have God, and who's next? Angels? And then? Right. So where's the list? God? Ah, 
Oh, so now we flip flop here. What's going on? Let me give you some background here, okay? Now listen to this. When the scriptures are translated into our language, certain definitions of a particular word from the Greek and Hebrew language were chosen according to culture and time periods. All the different cultures and time periods had to be considered. There have been times when you have heard me say things like this. A better translation for that word would be this, right? Okay, well, where did I get that from, see? Where did that come from? Is it just like, oh, I think it's a better word that can be used. See, there's a question, where did I get that from? I'll, I'll tell you, uh, it's from looking at the Greek and the Hebrew definition of a specific word. Well, where did I get that from? From a concordance. From a Strong's concordance. You see, there's a concordance that every one of us have access to, whether in hard copy or digital. It's called the Strong's Concordance. What it does is it goes through the scriptures and with the, next to the words in the scriptures are a number is given. And when you look up that number in, in, in Strong's, as you look it up in the back, it'll give, the def, it'll give what Greek or Hebrew word that is. And then it'll give you all the definitions of that one word. And sometimes there's multiple. There's like 5, 10, 12 different. So when it's translated into English, somebody had to get one of those words from that and put it into. But here's what happens. There's other words that were there that could have fit there. So it's good to have a concordance if you, as you look and you have questions about the word. You don't have to wait till Sunday. You don't, I don't mind. You don't have to wait until you can go to a concordance. It's called Strong's and you learn it. Now, if it's digital, it's real easy. Digital, I just press the number and I'm there. I have all the different things. That's where I, I get then you can see the translations. So when we go back to that verse that says what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them, you have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned him them with glory and honor. See, this verse used to never sit right with me because of what it did to us here today until I learned the importance of looking up words in the original language from the strong concordance. Earlier translations used the word angels. Why? What was the word there? So when I look up the word, the word is Elohim. Sound familiar? That, that man was made a little lower than Elohim's. Actually, Elohim's or Elohim. Why is it Elohim's? Because the word Elohim is plural. Now there's all the heavenly beings listed. I mean, all the different words in there and what was pulled out a little lower than the angels. Some of your modern translations already switched. And it says that man was made a little lower than God. But most older translations say it was a little lower than the angels. That causes, that throws everything off now, right? Our whole list changes. But when we look at the word, Elo, that word Elohim, we know Elohim is the word for God. So now that solidifies God, man, angels, animals, plants. The devil was an angel in heaven that became jealous as a result. And he was cast out of heaven to earth. His name was Lucifer. And when Lucifer became wise of this list, Why is all this being prepared for humans? We're here with you. It makes sense as to why Lucifer fell. He was not jealous of God. He was jealous of man. Because of all creation was for man. Not for the angels. 
Look at this verse in Isaiah 14, 12. It says, how you have fallen from heaven. Speaking of Lucifer. O star of the morning, sun of the dawn, you have been cut down to earth. You who have weakened the nations, but you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the, in the recesses of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. Listen to this. I will make myself like the most high. Who is like the most high? Who is made in the image of the most high? Man. Lucifer is jealous of man. Isaiah 14, 12 through 14. And we'll go more into that because there's a lot more into that. It's really interesting, but that's for another time. We don't have that kind of time right now. But let's look at asking for angelic help. So before we look at this, we need to see who they are. We need to see what angels are. They are messengers that minister to us on behalf of God. And Lucifer himself was jealous of man because we were made in the image of Elohim. We were. And the earth, sky, and all creation is for his children who bear his image. And we were made just a little lower than God himself. Man, unlike anything of God's creation, is made in the very image of Elohim. God himself. God, man, angels, animals, plants. Let me close with this thought. Last week I shared with you about how in my life shame slowed me down. Shame keeps us in a state of striving to be like someone we're not. That's what shame is. What if? What if? Right now, you are exactly who you are to be. People for their whole lives strive to be someone that they were never meant to be. And as a result, they never get to enjoy who they are in Christ. Scriptures say in 1 Corinthians 12, 14, In fact, the human body is not one single part, but rather many parts mingled into one. So if the foot were to say, since I am not a hand, I'm not a part of the body, it's forgetting that it is still a vital part of the body. And if the ear were to say, since I'm not an eye, I'm not really part of the body, it's forgetting that it is still an important part of the body. Think of it this way, if the whole body were just an eyeball, how could it hear sounds? And if the whole body were just an ear, how could it smell different fragrances? But God has carefully designed each member and placed it in the body to function as he desires. A diversity is required. For if the body consist, consisted of one single part, there, would be a body, there, wouldn't, there wouldn't be a body at all. So now we see that there are many differing parts and functions, but one body. It would be wrong for the eye to say to the hand, I don't need you. And equally wrong if the hand, if the head said to the foot, I don't need you. In fact, the weaker our parts, the more vital and essential they are. The body parts we think are less honorable, we treat with greater respect. And the body parts that need to be covered in public, we treat with propriety and clothe them. But some of our body parts don't require as much attention. Instead, God has mingled the body parts together, giving greater honor to the lesser members who lacked it. It, <clears throat> it has done this intentionally so that every member would look after the others with mutual concern. And so that there will be no division in the body. In that way, whatever happens to one member happens to all. If anyone suffers, everyone suffers. If one is honored, Everyone rejoices. If you are an elbow and you strive your whole life to be like a hand, you will never be enough. You will always come up short. Shame 
is defined as never being enough. Satan comes to still kill and destroy everything in your life. He is also known as the accuser of the brethren. And when the acu- when he accuses you of not being enough and not doing enough, that arrow is called shame. And shame will render you powerless and eventually destroy everything and every relationship you have. And you will miss the joy of experiencing what God has for you. You cannot walk in fullness from a place of shame. So at what point do you start seeing the importance of who you are? At what point will you begin to understand the importance of every part of the body of Christ, including your part? Let me say this. You are pretty special. You are pretty special. Even Satan himself is jealous of who you are and what you have in Christ. It finally clicked for the Apostle Paul when he said these words in Philippians 4, 12, and 13. I know what it means to lack, and I know what it means to experience overwhelming abundance. For I'm trained in the secret over I'm trained in the secret of overcoming all things, whether in fullness or in hunger, and I find that the strength of Christ's explosive power infuses me to conquer every difficulty. <laughs> May you step into his presence each and every time the devil shoots an arrow in your direction. Yeah. Information plus information equals more information. But information plus application equals transformation. And with that, I'll see you next week. Yeah.